Hello and welcome to the third episode of Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ramkumar. Joining me today is my co-host for this and all future episodes, Nikolai Herman. Hi, everyone. It's nice to have you with us, Nico. In today's episode, we got to interview a very open access person, a person as famous for his work in the fields of open science and open access, Dr. Peter Suber, the director of the Harvard Office for Scholarly Communication. How are you feeling about this interview, Nico? Are you excited? Yes, I'm super excited. It, I mean, because I'm also the head of the Open Science Workgroup within the PhD Net, um, and open access is, of course, one of the big topics of open science. So talking to him about the open access publishing or how the open access movement started is actually quite uh, exciting. In the early 2000s, there were a couple initiatives that uh, wanted to make use of the internet for uh, the purpose of publishing scientific knowledge. And he was actually part of the Budapest Initiative that started in 2002, as far as I'm aware of. And also there's an initiative called the Berlin Declaration of Open Access, uh, which uh, the Max Planck Society was part of. So hearing how they managed to get to the point where we actually uh, know that or where we actually have open access uh, journals and also uh, I would say like most people at least have heard the term uh, it seems to have come a long way so it would be interesting to see also what he thinks of the future of open access. I also think it'll be really interesting to see what Dr. Super thinks about the Max Planck Society and how they are doing in terms of open science and open access. Definitely, it would be nice to get an outside uh, point of view of uh, what the Max Planck Society is doing for it. So whether if we are helping to advance uh, open access and open science or if you're actually inhibiting it to some extent. Okay, without any further ado, let's get on with the discussion with Dr. Peter Suber. Dr. Suber, thanks for joining us on this uh, episode of the Offspring Podcast. Glad to be here. Thank you. We were actually getting quite excited uh, for the um, for the interview, and yeah. So first of all, it might be nice if you could maybe give us a short introduction um, to uh, how you got into the position you were are in right now. Because I mean, you started uh, studying philosophy actually, then you went to law school, and after you're getting your uh, professorship position, you then decided now I'd like to do open access uh, or be an advocate for that. So how did that actually come to be? Uh, this could be a long story uh, or a short story, so I'll start to make it short, but if you want more detail, just let me know. Uh, yes, I got a PhD in philosophy, and there were no good jobs at the time. There were some bad jobs, but I turned them down, and I realized I couldn't afford to be picky. The job market was not very good, so I went to law school as a way to wait for a better job to come open, and I finished. Uh, then I got a good job uh, teaching uh, teaching philosophy at a good school, and I was very happy with it. Uh, I taught there for 21 years, and I eventually got tenure, and I became a senior professor. Uh, I didn't really expect to change my career. But I was a professor during the rise of the Internet and the World Wide Web, and I was also a publishing scholar uh, in both philosophy and law. And as soon as the web came along, I began to put my publications on my personal website, and of course, I made them open access. And I did it, uh, I confess, uh, partly to play with HTML and just see what the web was like. Uh, when it was brand new, it was terribly exciting, even more exciting than it is today. Uh, but after I put them online free of charge, I started to get serious correspondence from other philosophers and lawyers, uh, much more than I had gotten from the print versions of the very same publications. So I began to realize that the web was useful for scholarship. It wasn't just cool. Um, and at the time, people were looking for uh, ways to make good use of it. And I thought, this is a good use of it that I don't see anybody else talking about. And it turns out there were a few other people talking about it, but uh, it was a very small thread in the much larger uh, conversation about what, what we could do with the web and the internet. But because I didn't initially notice those other voices, uh, I began to write about it myself, uh, and then 
uh, I guess I wrote about it more than other people did. So uh, eventually uh, I got a profile as somebody who was specializing in this, even though I was not, that is, I was a beginner like everybody else. Uh, and what I really hoped was that somebody else would be the expert and would publish frequently on this so I could follow them and get back to my regular job, which I still loved. Uh, but nobody else played that role. So in time, I became the expert that I had been waiting for. And about this time, I had a sabbatical and I was planning to finish a few philosophy articles. And as soon as my sabbatical started, I just found myself pushing all the philosophy off my desk and focusing on open access. And I spent the whole year working on it uh, intensively. And I realized during the year, this is what I wanted to do. And so I didn't lose interest in my field. I didn't uh, lose interest in my school or my students. Uh, I loved them all, but I just fell in love with something even more. And I realized I couldn't give up an excess the time that I wanted to give it or the time that it deserved while I was still a full-time philosophy professor. So I had to quit, and I did. Uh, so I quit as a tenured full professor, and I had no other job. Uh, that is, there were no jobs in open access at the time. But during my sabbatical, I had a grant to work on open access, and I was confident that I could get more grants to work on open access. It was a kind of, I mean, in retrospect, it was a risky thing to do, uh, but it worked. I really did live on grants for 10 years. Uh, and during those 10 years, I did a lot of writing and research on open access and was hired at Harvard to lead the Office for Scholarly Communication, which is my current job. So after 10 years living on grants, I came back in from the cold and uh, now I have a, an academic job again and a salary. But I would say most of my, uh, most of the work on open access for which I'm known is it was done during that period on grants when I had nobody to report to and uh, I could do anything I wanted. And my goal then, and one of my goals now, is to do my best to stay on top of everything that's happening uh, and to write about it, to share what I learned and to share my perspective on it. And that was actually possible in the early days because there was not that much going on. Uh, there was at least as much as one person could uh, handle. But today, there's much more than one person can handle. So I don't even pretend to stay on top of literally everything now, but I still do my best to stay on top of what's important. And of course, that's hard to do. And I admit that I'm only doing it incompletely these days. Okay. I mean, does your current position allow you to um, do whatever you want in, in the content of... Um, or? Um, of open access, so are you allowed to write whatever you want, uh, like articles about it and so on? Uh, I run an office that has a specific mission. So my first job is to accomplish the mission or pursue the mission of that office. Harvard has nine schools and every school at Harvard has an open access policy. Um, and my office's responsibility is to implement those policies. So I put that first. but. In order to do the rest of my job, I have to stay on top of what's going on. And if I wanted to write about it more than I'm already writing about it, I could. I think I would have the support of all my colleagues. But when I got this job, I actually shifted from spending most of my time on writing to spending most of my time on other ways to advance open access, particularly implementation and uh, pro bono consulting, that is consulting without payment. And so I spend most of my time on that these days. And I'm happy. If I wanted to write something, I could, but I generally uh, don't want to. I have other things to do. So basically, you are helping uh, other people that want to implement open access policies uh, to write them up. Yes. Uh, I advise them on their draft language. If they have draft language, I advise them on strategy. Uh, I advise universities. I advise funders, publishers, scholarly societies, government agencies, uh, startups, and individual researchers. Uh, basically, uh, when I was living on grants, uh, the grant uh, foundations uh, paid me to give away my time in this kind of consulting. And my current employer, uh, Harvard Library, also regards this as something I can do on work time. And I'm very grateful for that. Okay. So Right, so um, one interesting thing that you mentioned, Peter, was that um, basically the internet was, or you were a professor when the internet was starting to become bigger. So um, now the, publish, the internet seems to be changing the whole field of publishing in general. 
And uh, now I wanted to ask what you think if the like how the scientific publishing should adjust to that as well. Um. <clears throat> the short answer is it should all be open access. There are lots of other ways to accommodate it, but that's where I would start. <clears throat> I went through an article saying open access is the minimum we should expect from scientific publishing, not the maximum. Uh, and I felt that I had to say that at the time because the very idea of open access was regarded as radical by many publishers. Uh, and it's far from radical. It's the minimum of what we should expect. <clears throat> and once we have open access to all this literature, then uh, all kinds of entrepreneurs and tool builders can come along and uh, ingest that research and do interesting things with it. And those are some of the exciting things that go beyond the minimum. But to make those things possible, at least we have to make it open. And we have to make it open in two ways. These two ways were uh, spelled out in the Budapest Statement, the Berlin Statement, and the Bethesda Statement. But uh, I'll just mention them again here. One of them is that it should be free of charge. But the other is that it should be free of needless copyright restrictions. It has to be both in order to uh, allow machines uh, to have access in order to do the analysis or the crunching um, that would be useful to the rest of us. I think we underestimate how much uh, serious research today is already mediated by software, for example, search engines. We couldn't do uh, internet research without search engines. But there are other kinds of uh, software, sophisticated software, that would facilitate our research if only the software had access to all the texts and all the data that we wanted to use. Uh, and we're far from there. And one reason is that we don't have uh, the kind of universal open access that would make those tools as useful as we hope. But by the way, compared to 20 years ago, we have enough open access literature to justify people in building those tools and starting to build them. Even if they only work on the open access literature and they have to disregard everything else, uh, there's still a large enough corpus for them to get going. But I think they'll be much more useful to all of us uh, and more widespread and better known and more sophisticated when they have an even bigger corpus to work on uh, and in fact, when everything is open access. Then we can move beyond, let's say, making the raw material or the ingredients open to all the interesting things we can do with the raw material mm -hmm. and the ingredients. Yes, I mean, this whole open access uh, movement, I mean, as you mentioned before with the, the Budapest uh, initiative, it uh, basically um, said that there's a problem with the current publishing system. Um, and... Um, so the, you mentioned two things that are actually the, I guess, on the basis of this, which are the copyright and the um, access to it, or no, the free access to it. So do you yes. think some publishers have uh, already gone to, it's like one more of the traditional publishers have tried to take a step into the right direction to address these issues? For example, what I've recently read up on, for example, Springer Nature, that they, I think, uh, and also the Science Magazine Journal, that they actually... Uh, give the copyright uh, to the authors, or rather the authors keep it. Um, so what do you think um, about the situation? Uh, first, there are uh, publishers who make all their journals open access and who make all the articles in each of their journals open access. Uh, that's far beyond what Spur Nature is doing. It's far beyond what science is doing. Uh, but then there are journals that, or let's say publishers that are experimenting, and some of their journals are fully open and some of them are not. Some of them are half open, we call that hybrid. Uh, so different publishers are, let's say, testing the waters to different degrees. Uh, but there are already publishers that are full in, who are making all their work open in both ways. That is, no paywalls uh, and uh, no copyright restrictions. And there are a couple of ways to solve the copyright problem. One is to let authors retain their rights in the first place. Uh, the other is to have authors transfer them to the publisher, but then the publisher gives key rights back to the author in the contract uh, or gives the author a license to reuse the work in a certain way and gives the public the right to reuse the work in certain ways. Uh, there, if you did it very, very carefully, the two could be legally equivalent. Uh, the public could have the same rights to reuse the work either way, but it's uh, simpler simply to let authors retain their rights in the first place. And uh, some of the most effective and progressive open access policies by funders and universities are rights retention policies. And they make it easy for authors to retain these rights so that even if the publisher okay. would rather have them, 
uh, it's too late because the university or the author already has them and is keeping them and is exercising them to make their work open. I see. So actually that means that um, the publishers cannot gain the rights in the first place, even so they cannot have it in their contract, the publisher right. contract. Uh, Again, there are a couple ways to do this. Uh, mm -hmm. Harvard has rights retention policies, and actually Harvard was the first university to have university-level open uh, rights retention policies. But we also uh, allow a waiver or an opt-out. So by default, we have the rights to make uh, work by Harvard authors open, and the authors themselves have the right to make their work open. But if they think it's terribly important to publish in a journal does not want open access copies, then the authors can uh, uh, basically waive the license to make their work open that they already have. Uh, and when our policies were new, we didn't know whether the waiver rate would be high or low. And some people who strongly supported open access feared that the rate would be high, maybe 40, 50, 60%, but it's low. The waiver rate is about 5%. And uh, MIT adopted a Harvard-style policy. Their waiver rate is below 5%. University of California adopted a Harvard-style uh, rights retention policy, and their waiver rate is below 5%. Uh, about 90 universities around the world have adopted this kind of policy, but we only have data on the waiver rate from a few. Uh, but it, the waiver rate seems to be low. Uh, and so we give authors this right, and it's important in the spirit of academic freedom to give them that right. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we seem to be proving the proposition that if you change the default to open, then you change behavior on a large scale because most people follow the default. Yes. Okay. Well, that sounds interesting. No, I w wasn't aware. I mean, I have to admit, uh, as a PhD student, I first got into contact with publishing like uh, half a year ago. So only then I started to th think about copyright. Like this was completely uh, elusive to me before. Um, and yes. now I'm actually starting to realize how important it is to do this because I heard like that you can, yeah, just get sued if you try to share it on a personal website and so on. So yeah, it's, it's quite you an interesting can, thing. You can, although in practice what happens is you'll get a takedown notice or your the host of your website will get a takedown notice. And if you comply with the takedown notice, then you will not be sued. Uh, but it is true, you could infringe copyright if you're not careful. And so it's important to be careful. And if you don't mind me digressing, there's a kind of analogy here. Not only did I uh, was I teaching philosophy at a time when the internet was new, uh, I also was teaching philosophy at a time when personal computers were new. And I remember how cool they were and how I felt I had to give them a lot of time to learn uh, how they worked or what I could do with them. Uh, and in the middle of that, I thought, oh gosh, this is so uh, interesting and so complicated. There's so much to learn that this is going to take time away from other things in my professional life. Uh, but of course, I didn't begrudge the time because it was so interesting. That's exactly how I feel about copyright these days. Uh, more and more scholars are discovering, kind of to their dismay, that they really have to pay attention to copyright, the way an earlier generation had to pay attention to personal computers. Uh, it's unavoidable. Uh, it's necessary for your work. Uh, you could make mistakes if you're not paying attention. Uh, you could also take good advantage and benefit yourself if you paid attention. And so, yes, it takes a lot more time uh, to pay attention properly, and it does perhaps take time away from your work, but you really have to do it. It's part of being a professional scholar these days. Yes, no, no, I completely agree. It's, uh, there's like many things that need to be kept in mind when uh, you want to be a researcher, like uh, also the whole thing with the data sharing and so on, like having a mind how to actually do it, because oftentimes it's not that easy to just uh, say, okay, I want to share my data, but then what? I mean, you need like repositories and things and can actually uh, share it. And uh, yeah. No. Okay, do you mind if we change the topic a bit to oh. uh, another thing that uh, is concerned with uh, publishing, so the peer review process. Um, so I think this is a very uh, interesting part of publishing that basically decides on um, who whose work gets to be put uh, out. Um, so do you, uh, what do you think of the traditional peer review and do you think that there's like some new forms that could be implemented? Uh, for sure. Uh, I don't mind traditional peer review. I think some new forms are better. Uh, in the early days of my own work, I was very careful not to write about peer review because one of the common misunderstandings was that open access research was not peer reviewed or that it depended on a certain kind of peer review. And 
uh, peer review uh, comes in many forms. And if we had to wait to reach consensus on the best form of peer review, then we'd never get to the next step because we'll never reach consensus on that. Uh, and I always thought, I still believe that uh, open access is compatible with every kind of peer review. Uh, and of course, some kinds are better than others, but OA is compatible with all of them. So if you want to do peer review the old way, you can still make the results open. If you want to do peer review in some innovative new way, you can do that and still make the work open. So as long as I was uh, pushing for open access above all, I could be, let's say, agnostic about peer review. Uh, privately, I was not agnostic. I had preferences. But I was afraid that if I wrote about those preferences, people would think they were somehow linked to open access. Uh, and on the whole, they're not linked. Uh, but there is an exception. There's at least one actual linkage, a true linkage, and that is open peer review. Uh, when you make the submitted version or a preprint open, uh, then uh, first of all, that's a link between peer review and open access. The uh, public can view it, read it, and maybe comment on it. Uh, meantime, the editorial board might be assigning peer reviewers to do some kind of peer review. It could be traditional peer review. It could be some other kind. Uh, and then if some version of it uh, is later approved by the journal's peer review process, whatever that is, then a new version is put up uh, with metadata indicating that it's a new version and also indicating that it's a peer reviewed version. Uh, I do support open peer review. I also support retroactive peer review or what's sometimes called post-publication peer review. Sometimes those are the same thing, but sometimes they're not. You can have post-publication peer review that's not open. You can have open that's not post-publication. Uh, but I support both kinds. I think they're both advances on traditional peer review. One thing they all have in common is that they're not infallible. Uh, a common public impression is that peer review is a kind of validation. And if something is approved by peer review, it's therefore true. Uh, I think scholars know that's not true, especially if you're the peer reviewer. Uh, you're saying this is good enough to publish, but that's all you can say. Um, this is worth discussing further in my field. Uh, this is worth sharing. Uh, and it's a way of weeding out the stuff that's truly bad, but it's not a way of uh, isolating or verifying the stuff mm -hmm. that's better. Uh, okay. On the other hand, some of the innovations in peer review might improve quality. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a different proposition. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to add a small uh, thing to this because recently with the, with the pandemic and the amount of research that's going on, especially in the field related to virology and uh, statistics and various other things, we kind of uh, start to understand that even peer-reviewed articles which come on big journals like Lancet, etc., can have so many statistical anomalies. Basically, so even the, the peer review process, which is done with a very in a, in like a strict journal sort of environment, can have so many gaping holes in them because of the urgency of the matter. So that's right. That's right. In the last uh, week or two, we had some very uh, high-profile retractions on COVID nineteen, uh, and the uh, listeners to this may not know that the impact factor, let's call it the prestige of a journal is correlated with the retraction rate. And so it's not an accident that those high prestige journals were the ones that published the articles that were eventually retracted. There's a correlation there. And I don't have a personal explanation, but some people have speculated that it's the high prestige journals that especially want to publish the articles that will make a splash, or that have sexy conclusions uh, that are bold. And of course, those are the ones that over the large uh, scale are retracted more often than the others that are simply boring but true, or boring but accurate. And boring but obvious as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah, no, I mean, it's difficult to get out the articles that don't have this uh, punchline or that say they're like the best ever um, or the newest finding that will revolutionize the whole field. So, yeah, I mean, one thing that is kind of counteracting this a bit is, I guess, the preprints, as you guys already mentioned before. Um, so... Um, do you have uh, any comment on preprints? Like, uh, I mean, they started early on in the physics field uh, with the archive and only recently actually came to bioarchive to the biomedical field. Um, so what, yep. yes. So what is your point of view? I on strongly support them. First of all, all, mm -hmm. all, all preprints as we know them today are open access. In principle, you could have preprints that were not, but the ones that we're actually talking about are all open. So that's the first thing to like about them. Another thing is that 
uh, peer review is slow. Even peer review at fast journals is slow. And in many fields on many topics like COVID-19, speed is important. Uh, and it's not just speed in getting the results to people who might apply them. It's speed in getting your conclusions and analysis to peers who could comment on them. And so one of the important purposes of sharing a preprint is to get feedback from your peers and your colleagues. And you may do this uh, in order to improve the manuscript for submission later to a journal so that the journal version is actually better than the preprint. That's when the whole conversation system uh, works very well. On the other hand, uh, you might do it to establish your priority over somebody else who's working on the same problem. In other words, to avoid being scooped. You come up with some important results. You don't want to wait the, for the duration of peer review, which might be two years or more, uh, to publish that and stake your claim. You want to stake your claim one minute after you're ready. And in a preprint repository, that's exactly what you can do. Then you can work on polishing it up with your colleagues. Uh, but there are other motivations as well. And sometimes you know, different research teams are working on a hard problem like a COVID vaccine. And people working on different subtopics of that problem come up with different results in real time through parallel processing. And they want to share it with the other teams working on other aspects of the problem in real time so that everybody can make progress as quickly as possible. By, by the way, what... Mm -hmm. So yes, so I was wondering. So um, because of a more or less personal experience of mine um, about the preprints, uh, setting the timestamp, saying okay, I did this first. Um, so what would you say, to, uh, like if uh, to the situation that uh, someone knows someone, some other lab is working on a similar topic, and then you just put out whatever preprint that says exactly this is the topic, and it's not polished at all. It needs like I don't know, maybe a couple months more Sometimes work. Sometimes even a couple uh, of years. Just to say more work. Okay, or maybe, right. yes, and then just, just to say, okay, we did it first. Uh, if you put out something that's really shallow and makes a claim without backing it up, and somebody later puts out a piece with uh, the required evidence to back it up and the analysis to show that they really did the work, I think readers will understand it's the other team that deserves the credit. Uh, on the other hand, if you do have your evidence and your analysis, Why put up a shallow claim when you could put up a richer, uh, well-supported claim? And if you're doing that, it's not really the same situation. No, I, I agree. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's uh, like basically one thing that people can judge you on uh, with a preprint is actually that this is your standard of a publication. This is what you think is worth other people seeing. So you kind of set a standard for your own science, uh, right. I would say. Uh, I think that's one of the important, uh, call it bars to clear. In ordinary peer review journals, you try to uh, please the peer reviewers and the editor. But in the case of preprints, you want to please yourself. You don't want to put something out that will embarrass you. Uh, and that's a, an interestingly high bar. I guess there are shameless people who uh, won't be embarrassed by anything, like the president of the United States today. Uh, but most scholars have a sense of uh, shame. That is, <clears throat> they don't want to put out a completely unargued claim. By the way... Uh, when I say scholars have a sense of shame and they won't deliberately put up something shallow or embarrassing, it doesn't mean that everything they put up is worth reading or that some of those things aren't truly embarrassing anyway. Uh, it just means there is some standard there. Uh, and it's not equivalent to peer review, so we're not saying it is equivalent to peer review. Yes. It's just saying it's a reason not to put up that mm -hmm. empty claim simply to get a time mm -hmm. standard. Yes. No, no, that, that, I mean, uh, the thing is, I mean, I guess if you're uh, already uh, an established PI in your field, then uh, you don't have to worry too much about uh, the repercussions, the negative ones. But if you're still a early career researcher, for example, you can get judged on that. And I mean, nowadays, it's a more common practice that even preprints are um, being uh, evaluated uh, with the application. Yes. So I think it is... That's right. uh, It's actually um, no, it's important to set a standard for yourself and what you consider to be good science. I agree. Also, what's out in preprints can sometimes be cited as well. Yes, preprints can be cited. I cite them all the time. You reminded me of a, one more benefit of preprints that I forgot to mention. In typical peer review, the work is evaluated by one, two, or three people. And if it passes their judgment, then it's published. And if it doesn't pass their judgment, then it's not published. But in, uh, when you put out a preprint, it's being evaluated by everybody who cares. 
And that's really the way science and research ought to work. Uh, first of all, there's no time limit. And second, there's no person limit. Uh, and everybody who has a comment to make or an opinion uh, can see it and respond to it. And many works deserve to be published even if three people disapprove. And many works should never be published even if three people do approve. <clears throat> and putting out your preprint allows the community, allows the discipline, allows the field, allows the community of people on that topic uh, to weigh in. And in general, the evaluation of new work is best done by the community, not, not done by three people, even if they're carefully chosen. Yes, I mean, the, having just three people evaluate work is like is quite subjective, I would say, because, I mean, you get only the few of those three. And if they all fall into the same category of two opposing fields, for example, in uh, one discipline, then it can be kind of skewed what actually what, where this discipline is heading. Okay, with that, we've come to the end of the first part of the interview with Dr. Peter Suber. If you would like to get to know more about Dr. Suber's work, his book on open access and his website, all the links can be found in the show notes linked right below this episode. We'll be back with you next week with the remainder of what we discussed with Dr. Suber, especially with regard to research evaluation. The Offspring Magazine podcast is produced by the Science Communication Working Group of the Max Planck PhD Net called The Offspring Magazine, hosted by Srinath Ramkumar and Nikolai Horman. If you would like to get back to us with any feedback, comments and suggestions and people that you would like us to interview that you would like to get in touch with, please write to us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. Thanks for listening to us and please feel free to share these episodes with anyone who you think would be interested. And we assure you we'll be back with an exciting new episode every Monday. So I'll see you all next week. Until then, stay safe and stay strong. Stay strong.